Hello, posterity, and happy Sukkafest to one and all. My name is Eve Bratman, and um, my talk is called Before the Fruits of Our Labor, The Politics of Bees and Pollinator Protection. And um, I'm excited to share with you some of my, my work and research uh, about uh, thinking about global environmental uh, politics and environmental predicaments, as well as solutions for um, as far as approaches to saving the bees go, and and thinking um, you thinking through those questions through the prism of the bees. So um, my my talk is based on uh, a book in progress, which is tentatively entitled Bee Politics, and. Um, and I'll, I'll just spend the next few minutes giving you a, a taste of what my research has been about and um, the connection, of course, to Sukkot before anything else is that as a harvest holiday, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be having this harvest had it not also been for the pollinators. And Rosh Hashanah, of course, teased that up for us with eating apples and honey and then Sukkot as the traditional um, vineyard harvest of, of the grapes is, of course, um, yet another manifestation of earth bounty and connection, uh, not just to food, but to agriculture and to land and to the temporality of space and um, the ephemerality of time. And it's, um, of course, like my favorite Jewish holiday. And um, and I think um, a, a really perfect one for thinking about environmental issues. So um, I became a beekeeper originally in 2011 in Washington, DC, and I was beekeeping on the roof of a, a green building, which was where I worked. It was the School of International Service at American University. And at the time I was wrapping up um, my, dissertation research and um, book about um, sustainable development politics in the Brazilian Amazon. And on a lot of levels, um, my take on sustainable development in the Brazilian Amazon was really kind of depressing and sad, hard, um, emotionally taxing work and interacting with the bees and becoming a, a hobbyist beekeeper um, was a emotional, um, rejuvenation of sorts for me. And it led to asking some of the same international relations questions that I had been asking all along, but through a totally different lens, uh, as far as thinking about how pollinators could be protected better. What did it, what did urban beekeeping mean in the context of broader urban sustainability efforts and efforts to, um, to green our cities and green our planet? And I started also thinking through the, the differences in um, how we approach epistemological questions like, you know, what forms of scientific knowledge are considered valid within the beekeeping world? Um, how does natural beekeeping interface with much more scientific, traditional science approaches to beekeeping? Um, there's there's um, a bunch of stories that I wanted to tell about how bees can help us think through the issues of pollinator protection more broadly and um, and understanding in more deep and I think nuanced ways uh, some of the predicaments of global environmental cooperation. These of course are natural boundary crossers um, in, in both the, the physical natural sense and uh, also in the, the sense that pollination requires an interaction between animals and plants and between different types of plants uh, in order to have a, a vibrant ecosystem. So um, I, I subsequently have, have published a, a few journal articles, um, scholarly journal articles that may be of interest. They're both open access. One is about urban beekeeping specifically, uh, beekeeping in, of, or for the city. And the other is um, about the resurgence of stingless beekeeping in the Yucatan Peninsula and the Zona Maya. Um, and um, I'm happy to share those articles or you can look them up on your own uh, since, since they're, they're free. Uh, and open to the public. And um, I'll be talking a little bit more about those in, in just a little bit. Yes, Nathan, go ahead. 
I'll wait. I just didn't know what stingless beekeeping was, but I'm sure you'll explain it. Well, yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk a bit more about it, but um, real quick, we'll I'll I'll we'll we'll talk a lot about like the general um, problems facing bees and pollinators. Um, I'll I'll make a little bit of an argument for um, for for a um, an approach that I call ecological rapprochement. Um, which is about how do we how do we really reimagine on a sort of macro level our relationship with nature and find a mar more harmonious way of relating to the natural world, and I'll talk through practical strategies for 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 applying those ideas toward um, toward the end of of the talk and and we can jump in at any time if you'd like for for further questions. I'll I'll get to your stingless bee question with with a little bit more illustration. I promise. Um, so, you know, I, as a starting point, I think it's important to note that I think we're, we're largely as a society concerned with saving the wrong bees. Honeybees have taken center stage and they are wonderful creatures. Um, they provide us with honey, they provide us with wax, they provide us with um, propolis, which is a natural medicinal uh, product made from tree resins. Uh, they also provide royal jelly, which is used in both cosmetic applications as well as um, sometimes as a fertility treatment or a nutritional supplement. Um, and, and a whole host of you know, wonderful things can be said about honeybees, but they are not a native bee to North America. They're native to Western Europe and, um, and they are generalist pollinators, which means that they are really useful as agricultural workers but there is some controversy about how, how much our reliance and our leaning into honeybee keeping as an answer to our ecological crisis has, um, has on some level harmed uh, other native bee species because as generalist foragers, honeybees can feed off of just about anything. Whereas native bees require one or two specific plants for nutrition. Uh, sometimes a, a few more, but but in in the most um, discrete cases, a honeybee might outcompete a native bee for limited uh, resources, and and that can cause um, uh, problems uh, throughout the ecosystem. Um, Eve, Eve, can I just ask you a question? Sure, Ellen, go ahead. Um, you know when uh, the whole thing about colony collapse does mm -hmm. that? Is that relative to honeybees or other bees? So colony collapse is really specific to honeybees and was observed primarily by commercial scale beekeepers. So beekeepers with commercial scale, um, beekeepers with over 5,000 hives is, is a sort of baseline. Um, uh, and colony collapse was first noticed in around 2000, uh, six or seven, if I recall correctly. And, and there, were, there were some, there was a, a moment of real concern around it, but we haven't seen any reports of colony collapse disorder since 2014 in the United States. Um, beekeepers, honey beekeepers are facing a, you know, a huge array of, of threats and the struggle to keep bees alive is more real than ever. Um, particularly because of the Varroa mite, which is an invasive pest that, that um, transmits disease and harms honeybees. But colony collapse itself really has actually fallen off the radar. Um, it, it did, however, provide um, a key awakening moment for the general public to be concerned about the plight of the bees. And it inspired a lot of people, including myself, to become a beekeeper to try to save the bees. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know, honeybees are, are are what I like to think of as a charismatic mini fauna. They're they're inspiring on so many levels, right? Whether it's the the dynamics inside the hive or the way that honeybees will swarm based on democratic decision making about how they find their new home. Um, the ways that they care for their leaders and for each other and communicate. Oh, just incredibly fascinating and inspiring. But, um, but honeybees are semi-wild. They can be bred and their populations have actually remained relatively stable over the past 10 years. Um, in large part, thanks to these extended efforts by beekeepers um, who are really working harder than ever to keep their bees alive. Um, 
But native bees, it's a really different story. Um, in scholarly journal articles, they're writing about an insect again, right? Or the 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 um, the insect apocalypse that is coming. Um, some uh, reliable studies estimate that um, that the native bee population is, uh, or sorry, in the native po pollinator and, and invertebrate population is crashing at a rate of. Um, 30, like 30% 30 of insects have already been lost in the past 50 years. It was really um, stunningly um, scary how, how these rates of losses of, of insects in general. And of course, why do we need all insects, not just bees? Um, they provide an essential role in the food chain. I mean, even mosquitoes. I know we all love to hate mosquitoes, but um, between you know mayflies and aquatic ecosystems um, relying on um, invertebrates for you know food for fish and ecosystem integrity and birds that rely prim pr primarily on caterpillars um, pollinators and, and insects in general are, are really crucial to uh, to ecosystem balance and they're not um, a you know a big um, megafauna like say a wolf, but they are very much a keystone species um, when it comes to to the stability overall of our ecosystems. So um, that said, just to add a little bit of nuance, there is some debate in the scholarly community about just how bad the insectageddon is, um, and in certain places the studies are much more dire than than other places, and and of course with climate change. Um, and each ecosystem being unique, some species may actually be on the rebound and, and have ecological success, whereas other populations are, are suffering dramatic losses. So um, just a little caveat there. But we're looking at about a third of the bee and butterfly populations on the decline in Europe. And, um, and in Europe, about 10% of bee and butterfly species being uh, being listed as and considered endangered is what we estimate. Um, scholars um, have called this a death by a thousand cuts. Um, so the, the major threats are generally coming from uh, agriculture and um, a, an extremely heavy use of pesticides in our contemporary agricultural context. Um, pesticides, insecticides, um, fungicides as well, as, as well um, also have an effect on, on bees. Um, and we're also seeing major problems from climate change and, um, and uh, you know, related um, the heavier storms, the wildfires and, um, and uh, the, you know, related interactions of, um, uh, of, of climate change with changing plant phenology. In other words, the blossoming intervals for plants is changing and that has uh, cascading effects on our bee populations, especially for native bees that might only pollinate um, or have a lifespan of about five weeks in which they need to you know, get adequate nutrition and then reproduce. Um, if, a, if a particular plant flowers about two weeks later, this can have a severe effect on the bees lifestyle and its own ability to, to continue to, to thrive. Eve? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so do the native bees, do they only feed on native plants or not necessarily? Um, not necessarily, but for the most part. So there are some, some bees that have, um, you know, figured out how to adapt and, um, and there are, uh, although I'm not, I can't give you an example off the top of my head, but for the most part, um, you know, some, some native plants have also been here long enough that, that native bees have evolved strategies or they have hybridized with the plants enough to be able to, um, to use some of the nutritional sources from them. Some of the um, non-natives. Yeah, but honeybees, for example, which are native to Western Europe, have ended up um, having a lot of success as, as generalist foragers might, um, even from the, um, the dew, in other words, the, the um, feces, the, the sort of liquid coming out of the, <laughs> of the butts of spotted lanternflies, which are native to Asia. 
So there's a beekeeper here in Philly named Don Shump who is marketing a, um, a honey from spotted lanternflies. And, um, and uh, it's kind of an interesting thing because the, it's like now that the spotted lanternfly honey is coming in and this is the dearth period for bees. Um, so in this region, the only, the, the major native plants would be goldenrod, which is a good source of pollen and um, doesn't, isn't a particularly tasty honey, but, um, but beekeepers in this region are able to get spotted lanternfly honey and, and Japanese knotweed honey. Um, Whoa. Right, because both of them end up blooming around this time of year um, here, in, here in this region. Um, so um, yeah, so this, this slide, you know, talks about it as a death by a thousand cuts, but it's really important, I think, to note that not all cuts are created equal and the, the problems of pesticides, um, especially your European um, indications are that pesticides, invasive species, um, including like the varroa mites and, and other disease transmission that happens um, through introduced species and climate change are really the major um, threats facing facing all bees these days. Um, there's a, a, an implied pun on this picture for those of you who are real garden nerds, which is that this is the, the new paradigm day lily. <laughs> and so I would, I would suggest that we need a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about these problems. And, um, and I get inspiration from Rachel Carson, who said in 1963 that humankind needs to come to a recognition that we are but a, a, occupying a tiny space in this vast universe. And um, moreover, she went on to say that we need to end war on nature that we are waging. And that idea has really um, stuck around in the environmental movement that we are waging a war on nature. But we're not talking, I think, actively and pragmatically enough about how we can come to an end of this war, how we can at least establish some uh, truce in our relationship uh, with the natural world around us. Um, I also take inspiration from Aldo Leopold who, uh, who wrote in a Sand County Almanac about the, the land ethic and the importance of seeing the natural world um, not just from the perspective of um, the hunter or of the wolf, but of the entire mountain. And this idea of thinking like a mountain is also an idea that if we apply it to bees is, is thinking about the entire ecosystem and establishing what uh, the amazing writer, contemporary writer, Robin Wall Kimmerer, uh, who's of Potawatomi descent, um, talks about as a kinship with the natural world and really being in a web of relations with the world around us. And of course, bees do that as pollinators incredibly well. And, um, and I think beekeepers are beginning to understand that concept a little better. So my pragmatic step, next step forward toward thinking seriously about ending the war on nature is this concept of ecological rapprochement. Rapprochement comes out of international relations theory um, as a, um, and out of French, of course, um, uh, an increasing friendliness, a, um, an approximation of relations, a, a coming together, um, whereas previously people uh, or whole nations may have been um, in antagonistic relationships with each other. So this picture is taken from um, a, a joint effort at uh, the turn of the uh, 20th century, actually, I think it was uh, late 19th century, um, when the U.S. and Great Britain and a few other allies came together to um, to fight the Chinese. So, you know, previously, the U.S. this was the first moment where the U.S. began to actually think of England again as an ally um, uh, in the post-revolutionary war context. And um, and of course, they had a common enemy in, in so far as they were fighting a, a war in Asia. But, um, but the idea of rapprochement, of course, is also what allowed us in the Cold War to begin thawing our relations um, with, uh, with the USSR and which in, it involved um, bit by bit slow processes of, um, of diplomacy that 
that were about cultural awareness and increasingly sending over, you know, delegations to learn about cuisine and to do sporting events, all of which was about um, beginning to open up channels for thinking really differently about how our nations might be able to interact with each other in a in in a friendlier way moving forward. So I think of ecological rapprochement as something that that we could do in our relationship with with bees um, on a few levels. So so let me just pause for a second and ask you all a question, which is how many of you have ever been stung by a bee? Okay, I'm seeing I only have three videos on, but all three of you just raised their hand. Sheila, yes, you too, right? Maybe you've been stung by a wasp even in early childhood, and it left you with a fear of being stung, right? Or a fear of all of that general category of flying things that might sting you. <laughs> and, I, and I also carry a bee sting kit. That's how bad it is. Yeah. Um, so so the, the trauma that we feel, right, the sort of instinctive reaction that even a friendly environmental audience such as yourself might carry with us is um, something akin to, um, you know, a sort of learned fear of bees. And it's worth remembering that even honeybees um, will only sting when they themselves feel threatened. So stinging is a defensive mechanism for them, right? We think of it as, wow, that was an aggressive bee, it just stung me. But from the bee's perspective, a sting is a means of defending the collective hive. And especially even from just a honeybee perspective, the bee loses their, her stinger um, and I say her here because drone bees don't have stingers, drones are the males. Um, so a, a bee will lose her stinger when she stings and thereby her life, right? So she's sacrificing her life for the good of the common hive. And, um, and we, I'm not saying, hey, we need to embrace getting stung by bees all the time, but I am saying, hey, we need internally to do some work to think about how we can let in the risk of the wild and our encounters with the wild alongside the opportunities that um, being a little, uh, a little more close to nature, a little more close to um, the, the natural world that is all around us could allow us to, um, to experience through awe through um, beauty, through um, radical amazement, and, and also through like intellectual knowledge and inspiration about what is happening within that natural world. So ecological uh, rapprochement may be that path forward, beginning with a sense of curiosity, and also beginning with recognizing the, the, the hurt or the trauma that, that um, is experienced as, uh, as we have these encounters. Um, a little side note, I've been talking about stings. Most of the native bees, at least in North America, which is all I can focus on for now, there's 4,000 plus, 4,223 known native bee species in North America. Um, and the vast majority of them either don't sting or don't have a sting that is, um, that will yield an allergic reaction in humans. So, you know, we say, oh, I'm allergic to bee stings, but actually that usually means the particular venom of honeybees um, and bumblebee stings, you know, maybe are very painful, but, but may have a very different effect um, in, in one's system. And, um, and many of the other bees, you know, which, which you may see around um, may not actually be threatening or stinging to, to our human populations at all. So I'd like you to do just a quick exercise now using this concept of ecological rapprochement and try to imagine what does a habitat look like that's, that's friendly, not just to honeybees, but to all bees. And Sheila, I have a sense that you're already gonna kind of uh, ace this one. So what would, do, do you picture a garden? Does it maybe have some roses alongside some native flowers? I think that um, the more native plants that we can plant, the better. I think that when we look to see what are we going to plant, we want to have always succession growth. So throughout the season, there's always going to be something that will offer food. Um, I also think that um, 
we can truly plant our gardens so that they encourage bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, which is what I do. And um, just keep out those you know, flowering plants as long as you possibly can, because there might just be a little bit of nectar that helps the last flying you know, hummingbird coming through your garden. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, and this goes well beyond gardening. When we think about um, the ways in which we manage landscape, um, it's, it's relevant to think um, you know, beyond the turf grass and be as, of course, beyond grass. I, I can go on a long rant about that, probably spend the whole rest of this time that we have together talking about the, the harms of grass. But, but if there is grass in the garden, allowing for other species to coexist with that grass, including um, notably crocuses, which are an amazing early season um, source of pollen and nectar, along with clover and dandelions. Um, and beyond grassy lawns, um, thinking about the, oh, here's a, it's animated. Um, uh, beyond grassy lawns, thinking about the importance of meadows and the importance of um, forest habitats and even open patchy dirt um, spaces is a really important way of reimagining landscape and thinking about um, creating more habitat beyond just the, the little space that we've allocated within our pollinator friendly gardens. Right, so thinking more deeply about all of the opportunities as a, as a holistic sense of um, ecosystem and landscape planning is, is also really fundamentally important. Uh, this, by the way, on the left is the Dunning's minor bee and I noticed it, it, they, will, they will be ground nesting bees and um, they live in what is essentially like underground studio apartment condominium building or studio apartment buildings. So 500 or a thousand of these bees will live in their little individual burrows and they'll make tunnels connecting um, to each other and to paths out of the ground. And so you'll see in, in early spring, um, June actually, um, lots of um, pencil sized openings in kind of open or patchy uh, dirt and, uh, and it, it may very well be one of these minor bees. Yeah, Sheila, did you have a question? Yeah, and this year I just learned about um, the importance of not pulling out all the remains from last year's garden too early because there are many insects that are already nesting in there and getting ready to hatch their babies and also uh, postponing and cutting grass and um, letting it be a little bit higher because there are so many bees that are in the ground and so many other good guys that are in the ground. Yeah, absolutely. There's also a lot of bad guys too, you know, like ticks, but um, you know, somehow or other you have to balance it out so that you support the good guys yeah. as your priority. Yeah, absolutely. And so, now you make me feel so much better because my, my mother would say that my um, quote unquote grass in my backyard is mostly just green weeds. So, yeah, well, it's, it's yeah. a real aesthetic shift that is required as we think about ecological rapprochement, right? The, there is a lot of judgment around weeds and around neatness and around what, you know, what is considered to be a tidy looking landscape. But, and, and I would, you know, go to the mat defending the idea that we need, like, it's, it's fundamentally more beautiful because it's more diverse to have the sort of messiness that, mm -hmm. um, that a, a, a more biodiverse landscape requires of us. And, um, and there are ways to make it, you know, safe and neat and, um, and to, you know, have walkable paths. Um, a native bee researcher, Sam, Sam Drogi says, you know, I only have one garden power tool and that's a weed whacker. And on every path, he'll, he'll just weed whack about six or eight inches on either side of the path. And the rest is meadow, or the rest is tall flowering species that he lets lets go big. But but just with a weed whacker type of lawn maintenance strategy, you can you're allocating you know seventy five percent at least more land um, to 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 insects to meet their needs. And you know what do we really need grass for? Is is one of the first questions that that any home gardener should be asking. Um, Nathan, I want to get to your question on the stingless bees and talk a little bit about 
the the Mexico research because I, I find it some of also the most sort of inspiring collective action stories out there around this idea. So um, in the Yucatan, there there's this endangered, there was an endangered species of stingless bee called Melipona beachy. And these are stingless bees that actually produce honey. They, um, their defense mechanism is to bite rather than to sting. They don't have stingers. And, and their colonies um, have, have you know, very different um, uh, forms of organization than honeybees, but they do live in, in small colonies. And they, only, they produce a very small amount of, of quite precious honey. It's, it's, um, it's delicious and it's also highly medicinal. In, in, in Mayan traditional medicine, it's often used to treat um, uh, corneas of the corneas of the eye. What's the when your eye clouds over? I'm forgetting the words. Glaucoma. Glaucoma. Um, uh, no, not the disease, but the thing you can have a quick surgery to remove when your eye kind of cataracts. Cataracts. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, it's also used as like a postpartum um, uh, energizer um, and and a variety of other uses um, and. These bees were, were uh, so much on the decline um, for, for a variety of reasons, Hans, uh, landscape and habitat loss, um, rapid urbanization. And, and for a while, this uh, was keeping these stingless bees was considered like old fashioned, like, oh, that's what my grandparents did. And they were doing it with a very sort of traditional method of keeping these bees inside um, fallen logs, which is how they would reproduce in the, the natural environment. And in a really interesting collaboration between indigenous peoples of the region and, um, and um, even indigenous scientists, um, they've modernized the, the hive boxes and some of the, the methods for caring for these bees to, uh, to help their populations rebound and uh, revitalize the practice of stingless beekeeping among the youth in the Yucatan Peninsula, such that when I was visiting um, and, and doing this research, I was able to visit um, several, not one, but several universities that all had um, uh, stingless bee um, hives in, in their yard space and women's cooperatives that are organizing among friends in their neighborhood to, to host beehives. And, um, and now the population is actually rebounding and people are carry, keeping not just Malipona Beachy, but um, frequently um, at minimum three different types of native stingless bees in, in, their, um, in these sorts of contexts. And um, sometimes as many as 12 and 13 and so, different species of, of stingless bees um, from what I was seeing. Um, so the Mexican beekeepers, um, our, our honey beekeepers are also organizing um, against um, the rampant pesticide use in the region. Um, there has been a very successful suit against um, Monsanto um, over the use of transgenic um, corn, GMO corn and soy, which Mexican the Mexican government still prohibits. And so the Supreme Court found in favor of the beekeepers um, at, uh, in a, a recent Supreme Court, Mexican Supreme Court decision. Um, and um, yeah, so, so I think this also gives us an, an indication of where we need to head, right? Um, combining Western science with um, indigenous cultural practices, um, restoring and regenerating an enthusiasm for, um, for um, defending bees and wildlife more broadly as part of a, um, an exciting way in which communities can come together and, and be interacting with nature. And, um, and to this bottom point on the slide, right, um, it's, it's about a lot more, I think, than what's happening in your own backyard. And it's important to be thinking about your front yard or your backyard or the, you know, the synagogue's landscape. But it's also important to be thinking politically and collectively about how we can make these changes. And so to that end, you know, the Endangered Species Act is amazing, but we have so far only really listed one bee as endangered in the United States, um, the rusty patched bumblebee. And um, there are initiatives afoot to, um, to pro you know, it's, it, even the rusty patched bumblebee was a, a, you know, extended political struggle. 
Um, and um, there are initiatives politically like the President's Pollinator Protection Act that Obama signed and currently Biden's um, 30 by, it's called the 30 by 30 plan where he, he hopes that through a combination of nat uh, national municipal and, and local strategies, we can protect 30% um, of the nation as um, biodiversity supporting habitat by 2030. Um, uh, Sheila, you mentioned earlier, like leaving your um, your plants growing growing tall so that bees have nesting places in the the woody stems and pits of um, of plants, and and this can be integrated um, into city parks as well, and and, and highway corridors um, beyond uh, just simply putting up a cute bee hotel in your in your yard. Um, in Costa Rica, a city just outside of San Jose called Curitabat gave citizenship to uh, a particular, their native bees. And they've established a city planning framework that orients um, any city plan through a framework of what is the experience of the bee? What is the experience of the earthworm? What is the experience of the raindrop as it moves through the city's landscape? And so in, in this form of urban planning, it's, it's um, you know, again, a radically different approach that, that encourages city planners to think not just about the human population, but also about the more than human world as it interacts um, through the environment. Um, how does that I, change oh. the layout of the city? How does it affect the layout of the city? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is, um, there is existing parks that they have utilized, but they have done a real community engagement process um, with an emphasis on the, the poorest neighborhoods of, of Kuridabat to allow um, people to come together and say, okay, where do you need a park space and what can we do that that meets the you know the uh, a green space criterion alongside the, the social needs so sometimes it's like micro you know micro plantings near bus stations or um you know little pockets of of street plantings that they've used they have a, a really sophisticated like gis program in the city and so they've they've managed to um to try to map out you know pollinator corridors and to use certain criteria of foraging ranges and so on to make sure that in the pockets that aren't directly treated by parks that that there are some um ecological assets there for for the bees do you, do you know um so do you know why this happened here was it a charismatic individual like what is it about this place where this happened well costa rica seems to have an abundance of environmentally progressive amazing awesome things happening <laughs> in general like i i do think there is something um in the cultural and political ethos of the country um the i interviewed the mayor that instituted these policies and and he's part of a network of um sort of eco-friendly thinkers and designers and um and he unabashedly told me that he regularly has conversations with a hummingbird that visits his front patio on the daily the hummingbird's name is frankie and one day frankie told him to tear down his garage and um to to add more green space and he listened and you know the city rather than he he won re-election. He went on to um, to become Costa Rica's minister of education, and you know so so instead of being considered a complete wackadoo, he's <laughs> he you know he gets promoted and um, and he has a degree from Harvard School of Design and and um, you know just he is a deep thinker and I think there is um, you know some some real charismatic leadership there, but there's. There's also a real cultural awareness, and he talked very actively in his interview with me about the ways in which um, the colonial design of cities was meant to keep nature out. And um, he thinks about nature as um, it, when we see, you know, a hummingbird or, or any kind of um, wildlife in a city space, he says, you know, that's something that wasn't, um, that the city probably wasn't really designed to be hospitable to. And good for, you know, 
the the animal, whatever it is, for for finding a way to exist despite the odds, right? And so he's really trying to kind of turn the tables and couches it within also an, an analysis of um, how colonial planning decimated indigenous understandings of what it meant to be living with nature and coexisting harmoniously with the world around us. Um, in Santa Fe, there's a similar uh, pollinator corridor project, um, thanks to the Xerces Society, which is um, an organization doing really terrific work across the board to protect pollinators. And so they've given um, like uh, native plant kits to host institutions and, and host buildings and even sometimes families um, to, um, to, to try to create a sort of uh, more robust infrastructure, uh, landscape infrastructure that is of plants, a green infrastructure um, to, to protect pollinators. Um, and um, in New York, a college friend of mine, uh, excuse me, his name is Aaron Burke, um, has also been um, writing and illustrating about pollinator corridors and um, the importance of um, tree planting initiatives and green roof initiatives and, and beekeeping as, as a sort of across the board strategy for, for urban greening. Um, this is in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I where I teach. I, I walked past this um, nearly every day for a summer, and it was just a um, a little uh, personal citizens initiative to to model how different um, uh, a little patch of an underutilized space could look if you simply planted a wildflower meadow. And so, the by agreement, they you know mowed around it, but um, Suzanne Matos, the landscape designer, you know, just like they took over this little area and said, okay, here's our wildflower meadow, you know, we're going to cordon this off, give a little bit more for the bees. Um, and there's, you know, a, a hundreds, if not thousands of those sorts of spaces here in Philadelphia um, that, you know, nobody likes to, 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 to mow and to spend the, you know, to hear the mowers and the leaf blowers, etc. Um, and where a wildflower meadow might be quite welcome as an alternative. Um, one of the policy changes to start is simply in the mowing ordinances, right? Where in Lancaster even, despite having models like this, the city zoning code still says you are not allowed to plant um, anything that grows longer than six inches that throws off an unpleasant or noxious odor. And note the bottom language here, to conceal any filthy deposit, okay, fine, or to create or produce pollen. So the language is written on such a broad level that like, of course, it maybe it was initially meant to prohibit ragweed, but all plants produce pollen. It's patently pretty ridiculous. Um, and yet um, it's little um, policies like this that I think tend to lead to people Thinking, oh, I need to have grass and it needs to look nice. Otherwise, the city's going to come after me or my neighbors are going to be mad. And um, so shifting those policy uh, policies makes a difference. And of course, in, in conjunction with public conversation about how things could look differently. Um, this is in Maynooth, Ireland, a small college town um, where, again, signage makes a big difference along these um, these paths. And, and this is just a simple city park, uh, you know, greenway. Um, planted with, with wildflowers. Um, here's just a, another example of the stingless bees um, and what one of the, they're called meliponarios um, because it's not Apis mellifera, it's not the honeybee, it's the, the melipona bee species that they're, that they're keeping in, in these um, stingless bee um, uh, yards. Um, City USA, which is also actually a sub-program of the Xerces Society, um, has a program called No Mow May, where they encourage whole cities to not mow their lawns at the, you know, the height of spring when um, when bees are are coming out of their their winter semi hibernation. And um, uh, a research was done, uh, a research project was done here in Appleton, Wisconsin, that showed that um, the the yards that had participated in no mow may had i think it i think that the data it's in my notes on the slide which i'm not looking at but it was something like five times the the biodiversity 
in uh, over the course of the month. Um, just more visitations by bees and more biodiversity was the result in really stellar ways. Um, so, um, so, so stuff like that can make a huge difference. And, and there's also a, you know, a point to be made about how even in devastated landscapes like the, the, mine, the, 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 the mountains of Appalachia where mountaintop removal has um, decimated the, the ecology of the area, um, the, the court settlements against some of those mining companies have yielded um, quite a lot of money for landscape restoration. And a lot of that is being done with pollinator protection in mind. So they've needed to do a lot of restoration of topsoil and, um, and even bringing in um, soil in, in some cases, um, but they're doing a lot to, um, to plant those uh, formerly mined mountaintops with pollinator friendly habitat and, and even to make new native forest landscapes that are publicly accessible out of some of those mines, which is not just to um, be an apologist for mountaintop removal at all, but it is to say that um, I think on a, on a hopeful level that even destroyed habitats on some level can, um, we can find ways to help them bounce back and to repair and restore our relationship with the landscapes that we've harmed. Um, in Jerusalem, I talked with an amazing beekeeper too named Yossi Ode, who, who uh, runs a program called Magen de Volrima Dome. Um, and um, he's doing biodynamic beekeeping in a, 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 on the roof of uh, a shopping mall that was once um, nearly abandoned. Uh, it was one of Israel's oldest shopping malls and the building was, um, uh, uh, shall we say, not very, not very well designed for uh, the needs of its users. And a ar artist cooperative um, basically took over the top few floors of the building and has done a bunch of um, work to create programs and a, a green roof made out of upcycled materials. And um, they, they host classes in yoga spaces and um, plant uh, edibles on the roof of this building right in the heart of downtown Jerusalem, um, alongside having um, amazing um, beekeeping going on. Um, I'll Just stop so that you know, it's, yeah, you yeah. have five minutes still. Yeah, I'm, well, okay, I'm, uh, this is my, this is actually my, my last slide, but the last one is uh, there, right there. So um, I, you know, I talk in my work about how do we move forward? And, and this is um, a menu of no regrets. Uh, you know, I think the, the food analogy is, is appropriate here. Like on an individual level, we can do a lot in our own yards, but we'd be missing the point if we continued to, to sort of entrench ourselves in, oh, I'm just gonna become a beekeeper. or Oh, I'm just gonna take action only in my yard. Those are like the appetizers that whet your appetite for a curiosity about the natural world. Um, but on a deeper level, I think we need to do um, more collectively and, and to tie this back to Sukkot, right? Sukkot is all about getting together with people in, you know, in nature and having a, a combination of human made nature a lot in the form of our Sukkah, right? Like we have to build it and we have to um, build it from the natural world, right? We, we have commandments to have, you know, skach, be of, you know, branches and, and green materials and so on. So um, it's through that sort of togetherness, that sort of collaboration that we also get to larger systemic change and changes um, in, in policy and changes in our epistemologies and ontologies that are more welcoming of, of different ways of knowing and engaging with the world. Um, and so, you know, I, I leave you with this list and with this sensibility of, um, of using bees. Uh, I could say a lot more about each of these if, if you want, but, um, you know, using, using bees as a sort of um, gateway insect into a larger sense of um, connection with the natural world and um, a, a practice of engaging and um, restoring our, our sense of interdependency and relationality um, between people and nature. So yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And, and if we can have a few more minutes to discuss or ask questions, that's perfect.
Thank you so much, Eve. It's wonderful. Eve, what, why were the bees congregating on that, on that man's body in the last <laughs> What was happening there? <laughs> so that's Don Shump. And um, he's, he's a Philadelphia beekeeper and um, he's doing something called bee bearding. So he has a queen bee strapped to his chin in a little cage. And the rest of the bees are congregating based on smelling the pheromone of that queen bee. Mm. And, um, and he, um, you know, he, he, Don is like, you know, an evangelist for, for the bees. He, he's an amazing beekeeper too, but um, I, I um, ethnographically, you know, trailed him for, for a few days of beekeeping. And half of the time that he's spending out on the different rooftops where he's beekeeping, he's just talking with members of the general public who are asking him questions. And um, so he does bee birding as a way to um, to make honeybees, you know, less scary and more accessible. And sometimes he's also getting stung. Like, you know, I noticed that as a beekeeper, like sometimes, you know, I, I couldn't, I could just tell from how the, the bees on him are acting um, that, you know, he's getting stung, but it doesn't phase him at all. I mean, the guy is kind of like built like an ox and, you know, you can, it's a beekeeper, you learn to take stings, right? It's just part of the act of beekeeping. And some beekeepers even say, yeah, I learned from my stings. Like the bees are, you know, if I get stung in certain places, it's a reminder of other types of consciousness or other forms of body awareness. And, and other beekeepers like Don would be like, yeah, you know, whatever, stings on my hand, natural. So it goes, you know, you do what you can. Yeah. Thank you. Sure.